me just welcome you all this evening and introduce myself. I'm Sorina Higgins. I'm the chair of the Language and Literature Department here at Signum University. And I also, along with my intrepid colleague, Kay Ben Avraham, work on the Signum Symposia series. So I do want to encourage you to check out the Signum University events page so that you can see lots of exciting upcoming events. We have thesis theaters with MA graduates. We have guest lecturers and scholars talking about their books and research and publications. We have many exciting events throughout the year. Of course, the most exciting event that Signum has coming up is our big annual national, or I might even say international conference, MythMoot, which is in Virginia, June 21st through 24th. So I especially welcome those of you tonight who will be presenting at MythMoot. And I hope that this presentation will be helpful for you as you prepare and think about how you want to talk, how you want to share your research at MythMoot. Okay. Um, I would like to invite participation throughout this evening. Those of you who are new, take a look at your control panel and you'll see a section called chat. You can send in questions and comments to me. Those will pop up and I may be able to incorporate those throughout the evening. If you have any questions at any time, just send them my way. Thanks to those who sent some ahead of time. Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit more fiddling here and then I will take it away. Right. There we go. Okay, so I would like to talk to you tonight about some ideas for how to present at conferences. I have a rather pretentious title. This moot is a medium of exchange, conference presentations as communication and collaboration. But what I hope to communicate to you here tonight is that conference presentations, far from being boring, can be dynamic, vivid intersections of ideas. This event tonight is designed to give you some skills for preparing and delivering the kind of conference talk that will be a pleasant, engaging, enjoyable experience for you and for everyone who attends. And I want to think of it as sort of a story here tonight, a story with a beginning, middle, and end. The story has already begun back in your past as you prepared yourself, as you worked on your voice as an instrument of communication, trained your body for confident presence, and the love that you have poured into your subject matter, your curious, creative, passionate pursuit of ideas. And then the middle of the story, the main episode, the plot, is the presentation itself. When you go to MythMoot or any other conference and you share the drama, suspense, laughter, and enlightenment that you've learned with another group of people. But that's not the end of the story. The question and answer session, the casual conversations that you have later, and the collaborations that might emerge from conference networking are the rich results of a good paper. So my goal tonight is to tell the tale of a victorious conference presentation with you as the protagonist. This is not a critique session for mistakes presenters make. So when I say something about this is something you might want to work on, I'm not criticizing anyone who may have done this in the past. I'm just giving friendly suggestions for ways that you could maybe even consider improving in future. It's just an encouraging series of suggestions of things for you to try. And please remember that your presentation style will get stronger over time. Don't feel that you have to master every technique now, immediately, say in the next month. Work on some little aspect each time, knowing that ease comes with long experience. So I want to talk about preparing for your presentation. And this is the beginning of the story. Once upon a time, you had an idea. Maybe in a class, maybe in response to a call for papers, maybe in reading and discussing a work of literature in community with a group of friends, at a book club, or in some more formal setting. Now, I'm not really going to talk about how to write a conference paper tonight. That maybe is the topic for a whole other session. I'm really focusing on the middle of the story, the how to present section of it, but I'll just give a couple of suggestions here that you might want to consider. And my first one here is, as I say, a paper is a keyhole peek into your project. I don't think it's really that effective to think, I have to take my project, my seminar paper, my article, my chapter, my book like project, and I have to squish it down so I can present it all in 20 minutes. 
I don't think that's really uh, the most effective way. Instead, I recommend considering that you've chosen a little slice, a little segment of your overall project, and you're just sharing that one little glimpse on that day in that presentation. That's my recommendation. You're pitching one idea, trying out a section of your argument to see how it works, sharing one concept or one subtopic. I think it's a much better idea to just serve one slice of the pie rather than try to take the whole pie and squish it down um, into one serving size. Probably a pretty bad metaphor. But think of it as just presenting some section of your research. Okay, I'm gonna launch a poll here. Okay, I think that I've just launched a poll um, for you to say how many pages would you say you would like to write for a 20 minute presentation? Don't worry, we'll get to the whole debate about writing versus speaking freely uh, later. But how many pages do you think you would say go into a 20 minute presentation? Eight pages, 10 pages, 12 pages, more than that, less than that, what would you say? Those votes are coming in. This will vary depending on your rate of reading, but there is sort of a range of a reading or speaking rate that's recommended for maximum clarity. And how many pages do you think are involved in that? Looks like the answers are just finishing coming in. Okay, and the verdict is the highest number, 35% have voted for eight pages. Great, now let's see if I close that, do I share the screen again? There we go. I'll get it. Okay, um, so eight pages. Yes, I think eight pages is probably about a good range for a 20 minute presentation. You could probably push it to 10, but what you probably don't want to do is to speak too quickly in order to try to get more material in. Yes, of course, it depends on the size of the font as well. I'm thinking MLA style myself, uh, 12 point times New Roman double spaced pages, what I'm thinking of. So you might wanna aim for somewhere in the eight to 10 page range if you're writing out a script for your presentation. Next piece of small advice for the preparation stage is not to lose the academic rigor of your project, even though you're just sharing a little slice of this. Many of you have encountered what Verlin Flieger calls the so what question. You wanna make sure that your theoretical frame is firmly in place even in a small presentation. Because if you don't, you, risk, you run the risk of just making an observation and not an argument. So I'm not gonna go into the details here about the pitfalls of the compare contrast paper or the plot summary paper or the theme observation without analysis paper, but I'll just give you the piece of advice of make sure you keep in mind the answer to the so what question, okay? Why am I sharing this? What does it help us to observe about this text or this data? What are the larger concerns that it touches on? How does this perhaps reach outside the text into history or some other context? So keep your theoretical framework rigorously in place, I recommend, even in a short presentation. Next recommendation in the preparing section is to think that what you're writing down is a script for oral delivery, not an article for publication. So we write differently, obviously, depending on our rhetorical situation, depending on our audience, and specifically we write differently whether we're going to be delivering the material orally or whether we expect the material to be read in print. It's all about comprehensibility and engagement. I've come across some of these recommendations. Limit sentence length to fewer than 18 words per sentence. Limit syllable count. Don't use very many polysyllabic words like comprehensibility that I just used. You can consider using very clear signposts and transitions such as, so what I'm arguing today is, or my second example that I'd like to share is, and you can repeat very important points. You'd be surprised even in a short presentation that repetition of points can be very useful. 
I've heard a recommendation of maybe giving an extemporaneous summary at the midpoint of what you've shared so far. I think this would be especially important if it's a really fact-heavy or data-heavy presentation. Let's say you're giving a textual history of drafts of a manuscript and you've been lying those out and then you want to go over it again, answer the so what question, why does it matter that we have these different drafts? Or you're doing a lexomics presentation, you've done text mining and you've collected data about uh, word counts and various occurrences of certain syntactical units. You might want to stop at the midpoint, review the data you've presented so far, and mention again why it matters before you move on. You can consider including things like jokes direct addressed to the audience, references to other papers you've heard that day, or other things that have happened at the conference if you're comfortable with that. I have one professor who writes out a script of everything she's going to say at a presentation and she writes in extemporaneous comments that she plans to make, but she has formal training as an actress, so she knows how to deliver those lines as if they've just occurred to her in the spur of the moment. You could consider doing that. Do what you're comfortable with um, in that context. I recommend keeping quotes quite short, quite short, mm, two or three lines, at most, make it obvious that they're quotes. You can do this with your tone of voice. You can do this by saying, quote unquote. Perhaps you want to put the quotes on the screen. Um, what do you think about a handout? I'll open another poll. Yes, a handout. No, skip the handout. Hand out something else instead. What's your opinion on a handout? And if you like, in addition to the poll, you can send in more detailed comments for me to read about your experiences with handouts. Have you been at a conference and someone has used a handout really, really well? Here's one way you might judge that they used it really well. You actually referred to it later. You actually went back um, and used the handout for something in your own scholarly life thereafter. Chris Yokel says it depends on the nature of the paper topic. Yeah, which types of topics or subject areas would you think a handout would be more useful? And in which do you think it would not be as useful? While you're writing in those comments and voting, I'll say, I don't really like a big page, especially double-sided with huge block quotes. I'm never quite sure how I'm supposed to navigate those quotes. Am I supposed to read the whole quote to myself and thus miss a big chunk of what the presenter is saying? Am I supposed to read the quote later when I might not remember the context in which it was referred to. I'm not really sure. Okay, so it looks like, well, my putting in handout candy instead certainly skewed the poll, but 47% say yes, use the handout. So it looks like the handout wins. Um, I would love more comments on what types of handouts you have liked. Simple handouts with the main takeaways only, Kevin says. Maddie says, a presenter once said, if you want more info, I have a handout, and it was up to the audience to take it or not. Joe says, well, lots of foreign words are important. Put them on a handout. And Kate says, I like handouts which give reference points for further study. I like that a lot. I myself like a handout that is a sort of structured or guided outline for note taking that has space in it. So it has the researcher's main Roman numeral points in an outline and then there's space, not super structured, not like where there's a sentence with a blank left in and you have to listen for the exact word. Those frustrate me because I miss the exact word and then I fail to listen for much of the rest of the presentation. But I like when there's space for me to take notes. Several more people are saying they like references, maybe a bibliography, but Mark is saying handouts compete for the audience's attention. Yeah, and they do that at several different moments, don't they? The first is when they're being handed out. When, when do you hand them out? Do you have them at the door and everyone's supposed to take them when they come in, but then somebody always misses it and gets up during your presentation to go pick up the handout? That's rather awkward. If you stop and hand them out, you need to put that into your time and then you'll lose some of your valuable time for presenting. So there are some tricky things with handouts. Whatever you wanna do is perfectly fine. Think of it ahead of time, plan it out, time it, put it into your timing, and make sure that it's smoothly choreographed. Catherine suggests handout at the end, a stack at the door, and you don't mention it until the end of your presentation. That's a great idea. I don't think I've seen that done, but that makes sense if it's a bibliography. It's like it's a work cited at the end of your paper. So why not give that a try? 
Okay, so that's part one of the story. That's the first episode, preparing. But then we get to the real plot, the real middle of this story, presenting. And I'm going to talk about several aspects of presenting, timing, technology, do you write it or do you improvise it, the, vo the voice and the body, topics of that nature. And again, I still value your questions, comments, and input as I go. So let's talk about timing. Timing is an extremely important element of presentation. In my opinion, keeping to the allotted time is one of the most respectful, important, collegial, and professional things that you can do. If I take an extra five minutes above the 20 that I've been allotted, then I'm stealing it from the person who's supposed to come after me, or I'm stealing it from the Q&A that belongs to everyone on the panel, or maybe if I'm giving a keynote or something like that, I'm stealing it from whatever is supposed to happen afterwards, which is probably a very important snack break or lunch. But I'm also saying that my content is more important than somebody else's. And I'm being selfish by doing that. It's egotistical and arrogant for me to steal five minutes from somebody else and think it's more important for me to have an extra five. And it doesn't matter that you're losing five from your presentation. It also shows a lack of professionalism and a lack of preparedness. It looks like I haven't practiced and that I don't care about my colleagues. So I recommend practice, practice, practice until you get the timing of your presentation right. Here is a pitfall to avoid, and I still fall into this, just fell into it this past semester. The pitfall is thinking that summarizing the material will take less time than reading what I wrote out and timed ahead. So here's, here's what happens. I was giving a presentation in a class. It was a very short one. It was an eight minute presentation. And I looked down and saw that I was running short on time compared to how I'd practiced. So I panicked and I did what I'm saying not to do, which is, well, I'm not gonna read the next three paragraphs that I carefully meticulously wrote out. Instead, I'm going to summarize the material. And I said it much more badly, much worse, much, <laughs> I said it more poorly than what I had written out. And I missed one tiny little point that I wanted to make. And I'm not 100% sure, certain, because I was sort of in that panic mode and didn't look at the exact seconds, but I think it took longer than if I had read the three paragraphs that I had carefully prepared. So you might want to try to remember this, although don't beat yourself up. We all have those panic moments sometimes when we're in a public speaking setting, in a timing setting, and we somehow think, oh, if I summarize this, it will take less time. But we tend to ramble when we start summarizing, whereas if we've written and timed it, we already know it's okay. Um, Catherine asks whether 20 minutes is standard. It's, it's very, very common. And I have been reliably informed that 20 minutes is the time for MythMoot. Now, frequently what happens is you'll be given a slot that's maybe an hour and 15 or an hour and a half, or if they're really generous, an hour and 45 long. And then there'll be either three or four panelists and you're each given 20 minutes. And then the rest of the time at the end is for Q&A, which is a pretty important part of it. And the most common method is for all the panelists to present and then have the Q&A together at the end, rather than timing those increments separately. Okay, Kevin says very eloquently, the mind cannot absorb what the seat cannot endure. And I must remember everyone else is depending on my timing being correct. Excellent and very well said. So I think that time is extremely important. What about tech? Tech or no tech? Next poll here, PowerPoint or no PowerPoint? So there's a poll open for you. Yes, a PowerPoint or no PowerPoint or some other presentation tool. And if you choose the some other option, can you let me know which one you prefer? Do you prefer Prezi? Do you prefer Keynote? Do you prefer Google Slides, which is really just PowerPoint with less functionality? Um, now I'm doing one tonight because I did a poll on Twitter earlier today saying, should I do a PowerPoint tonight or not? And 62% said yes. So here you are. I am giving what the audience wanted. Um, there are a lot of benefits to having one. Some of us learn better by reading or seeing. Some people are visual learners. Visual people find it helpful as an adjunct to the verbal presentation. 
Sometimes having quotes on there, pictures, diagrams, or video clips can be really useful. Slides can break up the info dump, says Arthur, and keep people focused. So those are some of the ideas. Chris uses Prezi in the classroom a lot. Joe says tech depends 100% on the content. I'd love to hear more, Joe, like which type of content 100% tells you yes, tech, or tells you no. Kate says PowerPoints, when well done, are useful. They shouldn't be too wordy. There are frequently these new sort of rules for using PowerPoint crop up. One useful one is the 10, 20, 30 rule, which is no more than 10 slides, nothing smaller than 20 point font, and this is for a 30 minute presentation. Um, one person suggested 10 minutes per, one slide per 10 minutes of talking, which is quite minimal. There are lots of other recommendations out there for good ways to use PowerPoint. Tindra says don't use wordy slides. Best presentations I've had were almost all just pictures that brought the point home. Richard says the PowerPoint question might depend on your decision about the handout. Would you say probably one or the other, Richard? Because if people are trying to pay attention to you and your PowerPoint and your handout, that's a little too much, perhaps. Jennifer says if the presentation is informational, then yes. Yeah, Richard, if the handout, then maybe not PowerPoint. Catherine says people always seem to have too many slides. That's where the 10, 20, 30 rule might help. Kevin says PowerPoint, but make sure everything works correctly prior to the presentation. Yep, getting to that. Nothing can steal time more than faulty equipment or unfamiliar tech. Yes. Maps should be projected, says Joe. That's excellent. The worst presentation, says Maddie, is people just reading the slides at you. And I feel kind of the same way about a handout, but then I also feel frustrated when people don't read what's on the slides or the handout because then my brain says, well, but if it was so important, I want to hear it as well as see it. That's because I process so much of my learning by audio. Okay, so in the poll, we had 93% said PowerPoint, 7% said some other presentation tool, and zero said no PowerPoint. So we are obviously clearly still a PowerPoint culture. Um, just a few more comments that I received today over social media about the use of PowerPoint so that you can weigh this decision for yourself. While they can be a great tool, too often PowerPoint is a crutch for weak presenters who turn their face away from the audience to read their slide or who cannot organize the material effectively. A lot of people said just put your main points, sort of your main Roman numerals on the slides. Others said use only visuals and others said put only text. Some people said um, to do, oh, I already said that, no visuals, and others said to do visuals and not text. So you can see that there's, there's wide divergence of opinion on this. So I'm not going to say too much more about this because I'm no expert in this area. I haven't studied the effectiveness of presentation tools at all, but I do recommend to you the TEDx talk, How to Avoid Death by PowerPoint by David J.B. Phillips and do some research into effective design if you're going to use them. And certainly, whatever you use, practice your setup and troubleshoot ahead of time, she says when she had to start her presentation five minutes late tonight because of tech troubles. If possible, practice in the space. So that's what happened to me tonight that went wrong is that I can't practice in the space of GoToWebinar 100% without starting the, uh, the broadcast, and then that's when I found out that the audio wasn't working. Sharon Hoff told me that a factor to consider is how to adapt the presenter, how adept the presenter is with the style they choose to go with. Fumbling with technology is an interruption at best for both the presenter and the audience. Let's do a side word on notes. You may have been thinking about that already this evening. So when I'm doing a presentation, I usually read from my phone or my tablet, even though I don't really think that's the most effective method. Too many things can go wrong with the tech. Your battery can die. It's happened to me that I stood up to give a presentation and I rotated my tablet to portrait and the Word doc wouldn't rotate. So I only had part of the screen showing on the side. 
and it was very distracting for me. But because I didn't want to be up there fumbling with the technology, I just went with it, and that was an added stressor for me. Tonight, I'm reading old fashioned from paper because I don't have a fancy setup here with two monitors where I could be reading my notes on one and having my PowerPoint on the other. So I still think paper is probably best practice when you're giving an in-person presentation in a room, especially if you have a place that you can take each page and then lay it down as you use it. You can do the staple and flip thing. It's not a big deal. I don't think it's ever, ever a good idea to read from a laptop. If it's a super light 360 one and you can fold it into a tablet, sure. But I don't think it's really a good idea to read from a laptop. I think it puts too much up in front of you and can be too distracting for the audience. Any thoughts on that? Feel free to share them or anything else about technology whatsoever. I haven't delved into audio and video sharing, um, but the main rule there is just to practice as much as possible and in the space if possible. Talk to your conference organizers and see if you can get access to the room at a time that it's not being used for presentations. Find out what the tech assistance is ahead of time and get that all set up before if you can. Kevin says paper is great but make sure you know the presentation so well that you only have to refer briefly to the notes. Kate says, I've taken a tip from Dimitra Femi and used very large font with text in landscape mode. That's great. Uh, that really helps with reading it on the spur of the moment. So I'm gonna move on to the next part of presenting, which has to do with the delivery. And that's um, to do with notes. So actually, before I show you that slide, let me give you your next and final poll. Do you recommend that a presenter read a script word for word, improvise the whole thing, use an outline, use detailed notes, or use something else? And if you say something else, I would love to know what that something else is. What's your recommendation? And then share in the comments some things that you've seen that worked or some pitfalls that you've encountered that people could avoid. So the, the core question is, do I read a written paper or do I give a talk? Of course, there are many, many areas in between that. This is a big area for debate. Sparrow asked me to address this, saying that she would love to hear my comments on different styles of presentation. She's heard nervous undergrads who read their term paper aloud, and she's heard polished professionals with fancy slides who never looked down at notes once. I would say both are fine. Those are all perfectly legitimate options. And this differs from one field to another, seriously. Um, in the sciences, especially the hard sciences, you're much more likely to see a visual presentation and have the talk be just speaking about the subject, not reading something word for word. At literature conferences, at English conferences, it is very common to have people read their paper word for word. So I'll give the poll just another minute there. One Twitter follower suggested, have an outline based on your article, book chapter, book, or whatever, and go by that, but just talk about the subject. Maybe, but that question assumes a couple of things. It assumes that you've already written the article, book, chapter, book, or whatever, and it assumes a couple of other things that I will address after give you the results of the poll. Okay, 6% said read word for word, 0% said improvise, 56% use an outline, 25% use detailed notes, and 13% something else. Oh, by the way, tell me something from your point of view. Can you see these poll results? Am I just being repetitive by reading them to you? While you're answering that, let me give the feedback from the audience. Mark says, a presentation must be more than an oral transmission of what the audience could read on their own. That goes back to what I said earlier. Even if you write it out word for word, you're writing a script for oral delivery and not an article for publication. So you're writing it differently than you would write it for print. One main difference is the way that I do it anyway, it's much more casual. I write in direct address, I use I much more, I use you, which I wouldn't use in academic publishing. I'll use more colloquialisms and sort of casual references. Kevin says, I read, read myself full, write myself empty, and present myself freely. That's beautiful. 
Kate says, I've read directly, but I usually leave room for improvised asides, which are dependent on the vibe in the room. Yeah, and on your own state of mind at the moment, right? How confident you're feeling and so forth. Chris says, it depends on the situation. Most of the time when teaching a class, I have a few points that I talk off of. I'm doing a more formal presentation. I'll usually script it out, maybe not follow it exactly. Maddie says, it depends so much on presenter and topic, what you can do well and what you're comfortable with. Reading something word for word, I find very boring, especially if the person giving the talk never looks up, which I have seen happen. Yeah. Jennifer says, you need to practice so that you don't sound like you are reading. Don't slip into a monotone. Tindra depends very much on the material and how often you've presented it. I definitely prefer as an audience member those who don't need to read from a script but have clearly prepared and practiced. For something you know very well, you can just hit some high points and tailor based on audience reaction. Okay, you're not seeing the full results, so that's fine. Not wasting my time reading those out. Some people go so far as putting in cues to see to tell themselves how they want it to sound. People will write in like, take a breath here, or they'll underline or star or cap something to emphasize. Catherine, in your field, you have to be ready to be taken off on a tangent, which of course is better the more familiar you are with the subject. Kate is talking about the verbal writing style as well. Um, Devin is saying, I've never used technology for a speech or presentation in one speech. You used the full speech and only looked down a few times. You'd love to get to the point where you could speak and not use a written speech. Yeah, okay. Mark is curious how many teachers are present here in the symposium. So if you just want to write in and say, I'm a teacher, then I can, I can add that up and share that. Okay, so I agree with all of you. I think that the major factors in how much you write out are time and familiarity with the topic. Time, ready for this? The amount that you write out should be in inverse proportion to the amount of time allotted for the presentation. If it's a five minute flash paper, write out every darn word and practice until you get it exactly right and then read it word for word at exactly the tempo you practiced. If it's a standard 20 minute paper, I think you can mix reading and speaking freely and I'll get to that more. If it's an hour long talk, you can afford to improvise more. I've heard an anecdote attributed to Richard Nixon, who knows if it was Richard Nixon, who was asked, how long does it take you to prepare a speech? And he said, if it's a five minute speech, it takes me a month. If it's a half hour speech, it takes me a couple of weeks. If it's an hour long speech, I'm ready now. So inverse proportion, the shorter the presentation, the more you need to write out so that you can practice it and time it very carefully. And the second factor is familiarity with the subject. The more familiar you are with the topic, at least this is true for myself, the more familiar I am with the topic, the more I can afford to speak freely. The less familiar I am with the topic, the more I had better write it out. There are advantages to each. There's a specific advantage in the field of English or language and literature to writing it out. And that is extreme precision of wording. That's something that's lost when you're just speaking freely or improvising. Okay, so for me anyway. You wanna make a beautiful chiasmus, probably need to write it out ahead of time. Some people have that gift of making up beautiful rhetorical phrases with just the right timing and pauses and weight in the moment but most people need to write those things out ahead of time. And in the field of literature, the words are our subject. The word choice matters immensely. So I would say, don't be afraid to write the whole thing out. Even if you then, and this is recommended, practice it enough that you don't have to read it word for word, but you've written it out word for word. And those beautifully poised sentences and phrases are going to stick in your memory then when you've practiced it. Advantages to speaking freely are a more engaging voice, more freedom of gestures, and especially eye contact. Also ethos, showing your expertise on the topic by not needing to use notes or not needing to use a script that's freely written out. So my suggestion, as you're already getting from all of this, is to write a very detailed outline with precise wording where that's important and practice enough so that you can have just as engaging a voice, gestures, and eye contact as if you weren't reading it. So basically, you want your voice to sound as if you're not reading it, 
but your sentences to be as beautiful and precise as if you are reading it. I think that's the balance. That's the balance that I frequently strive for. Um, that's what I'm doing tonight. Like I've written out some whole paragraphs and some sentences and then other places it's just bullet points where I'm more comfortable speaking freely. But obviously this is a little less casual than a real conference presentation. Again, if it's an unfamiliar topic, if it's the first time I'm presenting on it, I write out the whole thing. Sometimes I'll write sentence fragments knowing that I'll be okay filling those in on the spur of the moment. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teachers present who have identified themselves this evening. That's fantastic. So you all have tons and tons of speaking experience in the classroom, which is excellent preparation for presentation. And we have a pastor speaking weekly three times at 30 minutes each time. That is tons of excellent experience. All right, I'm going to move on to body language and then the voice. Oh, one more teacher is speaking up. Excellent. I would love to hear your best piece of advice about body language, gestures, and the use of the voice in conference presentations, or really any kind of public speaking, but conference presentations particularly. What's the best piece of advice that you have about use of the body and of the voice? So the body. Eye contact is extremely important and there's just the right balance that you want to hit. One pitfall is the looking down and up really fast, like reading two or three words and then looking at the audience. Sometimes that can be a little distracting and it doesn't allow for that sense that the speaker and the audience are connected. I'm trying to make eye contact with the webcam here, so hopefully that's working somewhat for you. And the body language wants to have this nice balance of being engaging but restrained. The gestures are more or less relevant, that they're not repetitive gestures unrelated to the material. Chris recommends avoid fiddling with something in your hands. Any other advice that you have? Posture is important. There are lovely training videos available online on each of these topics. So if you feel like you want to work on gestures, you want to work on eye contact, you want to work on posture, you can easily find those or you can contact me and I can recommend some. If you are able to do so, please stand. You might want to discuss this with your panel moderator ahead of time to make sure that the room is set up such that you can stand. And I recommend standing behind something that hides you as little as possible. Obviously, if there's a big solid podium in the room that's stuck to the floor, then that's that's all um, you can use. N maybe not pacing back and forth, maybe a little bit. Um, if you're not able to stand, try to have as much of your person visible as possible. Again, work with the panel moderator to set it up so that you're not sitting down behind something that's too high because you can, you can project poise and confidence with your whole person in the space. Catherine recommends not jingling the change in your pocket. Jennifer recommends not swaying on your feet as you talk. Kevin sums it up. The body language should be natural and appropriate to the event. Nothing can distract more than saying one thing with your mouth and another with your body. See, Kevin, you have those poised sentences, that memorable syntax that I can tell comes from lots of years of practice and experience. That's great. I wouldn't be able to do that necessarily in the spur of the moment. I would want to write those out. Kate says, know when to pause and put some variety in your voice, tempo, intonation, volume. Chris recommends Kimmy Schmidt power poses. So you can, you can check those out, the power poses. What, the starfish, the CEO, and the Wonder Woman? Are those the power poses, right? I strongly recommend have a friend record you practicing and record you presenting. And then you watch the video and see what it is that you do that you can set as goals to work on in the future. And I say intentionally have a friend record that because if you just do it alone in a room, chances are you're going to behave differently than you will when there's another human in the room. So practice the presentation to your friends while they record you and then you can watch the video again. I mean, better yet, practice it on a captive audience of students or family members or somebody, uh, a group of people, and then watch that back again. So I recommend that. Now let's get even more particular with the voice. The voice is very important to me. This is partly because I'm, as I mentioned before, I learn mostly through 
auditory, through oral and aural delivery mechanisms. And I've also had some training as a classical musician, so my ears are attuned to that. But regardless of just my taste, I think that the voice is one of your most powerful instruments for communication in a presentation setting. And it doesn't matter what voice you were born with, there are all kinds of techniques that you can learn to maximize your verbal power. And there are some things that you can maybe practice to avoid. Here are some that I can recommend avoiding. Verbal tics we'll talk about first. Now, don't panic over verbal tics. The occasional um, uh, using like in casual syntax, saying do you know when you really mean it, perfectly fine. Don't worry about the occasional um, uh, especially if you are deliberately pausing to choose um, what is the exact word right. That's the one I want to share. Perfectly fine. What we're talking about is the point when it becomes distracting when it gets to the stage that the audience is paying attention to the verbal tick instead of to the content. Now, the good news is these are very easy to overcome. They're super, super helpful techniques. They are great Howcast videos. They're really good um, on how to overcome these. So you can watch a bunch of these. You can try out some of the techniques. I'm gonna share some right now that I sort of combine the ones that I liked the most, the ones that I looked at first, record. And for this, you can just do an audio recording, right? Second, count how many of each of the verbal ticks you use. Chances are there are one or two that maybe are your pet ones or that are my most common ones. Next, make a visual to remind you to get rid of this. So one excellent video says to make a, a cross out sign, like a no smoking sign over the word, and then put it somewhere where you're going to see it dozens or hundreds of times a day. You wear an Apple Watch, put it over that for one day so that every time you try to check your text, your reminders, you'll see it. Put it on your phone, put it on your monitor, put it on your mirror, somewhere you're going to see it dozens or hundreds of times a day. So then the brain will start to take that visual and translate it into a no, no, don't say um, don't say you know. And after a couple of days, the brain will start catching when you're doing it. It will take a couple of days, and then they say it will take a week before you actually stop using the verbal tick. But that's just a week. That's really encouraging to me. I think that's very hopeful to overcome it. There are other methods you can use, especially ones that involve other people, such as giving someone cards with the um crossed out or the like crossed out, and then they flash that at you every time you say it. And that would probably take about the same period of time, but you have to have a willing partner to help you with that. Don't worry if these come back into presentations again for a while, just keep at it. Do it again the week before and the week after each presentation and eventually you'll reduce them to a non-distracting frequency, which is the goal. Now the next two, throat clearing and vocal fry, these are also distracting, but they're, they're medically dangerous as well. These are things that actually damage the vocal cords. So unnecessary throat clearing, and then the speaking of the voice in the back of the throat, when it's really low like that, and it's gravelly because the cords are rubbing, they're too, are closing up too much, right? That's a fairly, fairly common way of speaking. These create dangerous vocal nodes um, on the vocal cords, which need to be surgically removed and can do serious damage to the body, as well as being distracting in the room. But again, really positive. It's really easy to overcome these. Watch a few videos. Ask me if you want recommendations of resources. You can overcome these probably in a week to some extent. And then over a longer period of time, you can continue to master those little by little by little. Projection in the space in the room is very important. If you're serious about this, you might want to consider getting some voice training, take some singing lessons, take some theater vocal coaching classes, talk to a vocal therapist if you're worried about any of these things. But don't be concerned about it. These are all perfectly able to be overcome in a reasonable period of time, and they will not be a burden to your presenting over time. Kate suggests it helps to visualize speaking through your eyes. It will place your voice out of your throat and also encourage eye contact with the audience. That's brilliant, Kate. The reason, to get kind of technical, is that 
you essentially have these resonating cavities higher up in your head. Singers know this, um, sort of like the hollow space in a violin, right? So if you're speaking in your throat, then you're using a much more constricted airflow. You're not supporting it with a whole lot of breath, even though it might sound kind of cool. But if you raise it up further in the head, you get more of that resonance and the voice travels further. You don't have to go all Julia Child with it, but that can be really cool too. That kind of a voice really travels in a room. It can get a little tedious to listen to as well. Kevin says, lowering the voice has the power to bring back the audience and see them drifting. A lowered voice also builds tension. Beware of overpowering the audience with too much volume. Remember to allow the material you present to move you and it will move your audience. Be appropriate to the venue. Do not over project. Yes, excellent. Uh, I, I've sometimes seen there's like a one volume setting or sorry, a two volume setting, my ordinary conversation, and then my presentation volume setting. And that's the only volume I use for the whole presentation. Yeah, you're right. Let the content and the drama of the story you're telling dictate the volume that you want to use. You can even use a little vocal fry sometimes for some drama, as long as you know what you're doing and you are in control of it. You also want to speak in a range that's natural for you too. I could get off on this because there are many people who speak in a, a higher pitch than is actually healthy for their vocal cords. So, all right, anyway. Um, Kate, now you want to hear a Julia Goodchild's presenting on Hobbit cuisine. The only trick is to use tons and tons of butter. Always use tons of butter in everything you're cooking. That's the trick. All right, so I won't even get off into the side note about the voice and uh, psycho-emotional connections with the voice and things like that. But if you're interested, drop me a line and we'll chat about that because it's absolutely fascinating. So to summarize this section on the presentation itself, practice and practice, and then take yourself on, and your audience on a journey through the subject matter that you love and that you care about and on which you are the expert. It is an adventure. And yes, adventures might be nasty, uncomfortable things, but since you've practiced the timing, at least nobody will be late for dinner. And remember, you are the expert in the room on this slice of this subject matter. I don't care if the most world famous, award-winning book publishing expert on the entire planet is in the room with you. You are still the expert on this particular piece that you've chosen to present. Even if you're just an undergraduate and this is your term paper, that person, that world famous expert will not have looked at exactly the same set of data or the same selection of text through exactly your lenses. They don't have your experience. They're not you. So you have something to offer that no one has thought of before. Be confident, be brave, practice a lot, expect some danger, and have some fun along the way. But it's not even done then, because then there's the after party. There's the networking. Finally, you've given the paper, you're done. But that was the whole middle of the story. The short little end of the story is the Q&A session, and that's not even really the end because then there's networking to be done afterwards. Um, you, too much to say here. You can totally tailor this to your introversion, extroversion ratio. That's perfectly fine. You can do all of it digitally later. You don't have to um, chat up at the party if you're uncomfortable with that. Do what's comfortable for you. But just a few suggestions here as I, as I wrap up and do send in any final thoughts as I am closing. There's really no way to prepare, strictly speaking, for the Q&A because you have no idea what people will ask. You can plant question seeds in your paper, like, I won't share my third example here, but you can always ask me about it later. It'd be super nice then if somebody in the Q&A then said, hey, what was that third example that you didn't share? And then you can. Of course, there's always that one person who's like, now, what would Derrida have to say about your topic? And then there's always one other who starts a sentence that doesn't stop for five minutes and involves three anecdotes that go off to the various sides and then wraps up with, I guess I don't really have a question. So those can be challenging to deal with. But here are some pieces of advice. My first piece of advice probably would be, just be honest. If somebody asks a question you don't know, just say so. And you can just say, I don't know. That's a fascinating question. I might like to look into that, thanks. And that's absolutely perfectly fine. Super networking tip. Go to that person afterwards and say, what do you think Derrida would have to say about my topic? Um, that would be that would be nice, a nice way to create a connection. Don't shame people, the person with the five minute series of anecdotes. You can simply thank them for their comment and move on. You can say, yeah, OK, I see. I thank you for sharing that story. Uh, maybe if there are any other questions that I can answer, something like that. 
you can maybe use the time to share relevant material that wasn't in the main paper, but only if it's relevant. It's so tempting. Yeah, I have no idea what Derrida would say about this question, but let me share that third example I didn't get to share earlier, right? Ideally, you'll have some really good questioners who've been listening closely and have good questions that you would love to answer. If you in turn get to serve as a panel moderator, please stop that person with the rambling five minute story. Just stop them. That Q&A is not the time for that. Over cocktails is the time for that. Don't let them go on. Rephrase questions to make them more relevant. Help your panelists when you get to sit in that seat. And when you in turn are in the audience, it would be great if you'd be the one to ask the clear, short, focused, relevant questions that you know the presenter would love to hear. Listen for their question seeds and help them to grow. And then don't stop. Don't the great tales ever end? Well, a good paper generates good conversations and more papers and book projects. Seek out people whose papers are on related topics and strike up conversations about the connections. Seek out the experts in your field and ask to have lunch or tea with them. Ask them about their work. Asking questions is a really, really great way to do this networking. Saying, what are you working on now? Or what's your next project? Those are really great questions. That's probably better than pushing your own ideas forward if they're reasonable. After a while, they'll probably say, and what about you? And it will turn into a back and forth. Of course, this is uh, common sense, but I know we can be really enthusiastic at these things. Conferences are pretty intense and they're exhausting. So you can be careful of personal space and personal time. Don't impose. I have found experienced scholars to be incredibly generous with their time and their help and their resources. They love assisting emerging scholars, but help them make sure they get time to eat, sleep and relax and talk to others and do that yourself. If networking exhausts you, give your paper and then go crash. Like I said, you can send the emails later. So those are my ideas. It's a lot, but just pick out one or two things to work on and then you can come back and work on some others later. I'd love to get more feedback, suggestions. A final comment, I said in the beginning, this is specially directed for those of you who are going to be at MythMoot so that you can practice some of these things for your MythMoot presentations. Ironically, I will not be at MythMoot this year, alas. Um, it's very heartbreaking. But hey, then you don't have to think that I'm sitting in the back of the room counting your verbal ticks and your throat clearings, right? Um, but I'm gonna make an offer, ready? First three people to send me a video recording of your finished, practiced, and polished, timed 20-minute presentation, I'll send you feedback. I'll send you feedback in these categories that I shared tonight. So the first three people to email me that, and when I say first three, that might not be until you know June 15th. I have no idea when papers get written. But the first three to send me those, I'll give you feedback. It won't be immediate, but it will, I will endeavor to get it to you enough time ahead of MythMoot that the feedback will be useful. And together, we'll keep the great tales going on and on together in fellowship and in good company. All right. Thank you very much. A few comments coming in. I'll just take a minute to read them myself, but feel free to sign off, and I'll sign off here in just a few seconds. Thank you all so very much for being here. This is really lively. I, I really loved it. I didn't talk about creative ways that conference presentations are going, flash paper sessions, round tables, other more collaborative ways. That's that's the way of the future. We're getting there, but maybe we can do another uh, another event on that later. Okay, thanks everybody very much. I'm gonna sign off now. Bye.